Um, thank you very much for joining the meeting today. Uh, my name is Susana Baston. I work at the SETMAR, the Technological Center of the Sea in Northwest of Spain, in Galicia. Uh, this is our fourth webinar uh, about stakeholder engagement within the Breath for Blue project. And is here with me today Lucia Fraga and Marta Rodriguez from SETMAR and Dionisio Perez, who will be the speaker of today's webinar, talking about the co-creation for transformational adaptation to water scarcity under deep uncertainty. Um, I mentioned a few, I like to mention some technical issues. Uh, after the speaker's talk today, you can um, raise any question that you will have about it. Uh, for that, there is a button, which is the questions and answers button. Um, for any other issues or comments, you have the chat as well. And just mentioned that the meeting will be recorded and a link uh, for uh, sharing the, the webinar with others or watch it again will be shared with you after what, afterwards. So the Prep for Blue uh, project is within the mission Ocean and Waters, but I like to introduce first the Horizon Europe missions. In 2016, uh, five missions were um, identified, or uh, those are the climate mission, the cancer mission, the smart cities mission, the soil mission, and the ocean and waters mission. The aim of those are to provide concrete solutions to some of our greatest challenges, and they have ambitious goals and will deliver concrete results by 2013. Uh, the aim of the Prep for Blue stakeholder engagement webinars is to provide examples and good practices on stakeholder methods and tools. And we hope that will be useful for upskilling participants in the use of uh, different stakeholder methods and tools. Uh, in particular, for those uh, in the framework of the Mission Ocean and Waters, the coordination and support actions, and the Prep for Blue. The Mission Ocean and Waters have three main objectives. The protect and restore marine and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity, prevent and eliminate pollution of our oceans, seas and waters, and make the sustainable economy carbon neutral and circular. There are also two enablers, which are the digital ocean and water knowledge system and the public mobilization and engagement. And it's within this framework that these webinars fit in. Um, so the Prep for Blue is a wholesome use a Horizon Europe funded project um, with 17 partners with the aim of delivering uh, methods and tools for the co-creation, um, for research and development and innovation modalities of co-creation. So yeah, as I said before, we hope that will be useful for those working on projects uh, related with the mission lighthouses. There are four um, lighthouses at the moment, uh, the Atlantic and Arctic, the Baltic and North Sea, the Danube and Black Sea, and the Mediterranean one. And those are in the, in the first phase. Um, and we hope that we have more lighthouses um, after next year. Um, this webinar are based on previous webinars about citizen engagement. I share here some of results um, reports and also the link for the webinars itself. Um, within the project, we differentiate between citizens and stakeholders. Citizens are the uh, people with personal interest, uh, non -specialized, with non-specialized uh, knowledge or just not representing any specific um, company or uh, any other in entity when stakeholders are representing uh, a global interest for the company or the institution that they represent. Um, within the stakeholder engagement uh, work that we are developing within Prep for Blue, we have the, the mission database, which is called Wavelinks. Uh, I 
inviting you to register there because there is this stakeholder uh, tab, tab with more than uh, 14,000 uh, stakeholders identified. So can help you uh, for future proposals or any kind of uh, stakeholder engagement that you are doing. Um, also, I share here some of the deliverables within the uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, there are some guidelines and some recommendations that if you go through um, to the Prep for Blue website, you can have a look. Um, as I said, this is the fourth one uh, and the webinar is going to be recorded so people can uh, watch them uh, afterwards. The, I wanted to share with you the three uh, first one that uh, took place in July. And again, if you go through the Prep for Blue website uh, under the event tab, you can find the previous uh, webinars. So I just give some uh, information about the ocean knowledge ecosystem um, stakeholders, the different stakeholders, which uh, we classify or we based in the uh, triple helix. Um, there are the socioeconomic systems, the knowledge ecosystems and the governance. And there are bilateral uh, relationships between them. We identify the interests and needs for them. Uh, so the interests for the government, for the governance are the policies and funding. For the knowledge providers, they are interested in obtaining data and sharing knowledge. And the socioeconomic ecosystems are interested in also knowledge-based ec uh, economical development. So if we see deeper into those groups, um, we see that there are a division within each um, hylex, uh, leg of the hylex. So the governance can be split in decision makers and funding organizations. Decision makers include policy makers, marine protect protected areas managers, standardization bodies, and the funding organizations, including think tanks in marine science and others. Within the knowledge ecosystem, um, we differentiate between the knowledge owners and the knowledge providers. The knowledge owners are schools, uh, universities, and research and technology organizations, and the knowledge providers are the schools and vocational and educational training centers, media, and the ocean literacy networks. And the socioeconomic ecosystems are split in businesses and industry, and the citizens and uh, civil society organizations. So um, there are four uh, types of engagement. Um, I assume that you have any uh, relation with stakeholder engagement. So I'm sure that you are familiar with some of the methods that we are um, showing here. So the first uh, level of engagement is inform, in which provide interested parties with information about a specific topic. Then we have the second level, which is consult, in which you want to obtain stakeholders' feedback. A third level, which is involve and collaborate, where the partners with key stakeholders in diverse activities design and implement solutions. And the last one will be empower, um, that take place in a stakeholder, that plays the, the final decision into the stakeholders. So I, you can find here some techniques um, for informing. Well, we have the newsletters, we have meetings or conferences, we have websites for consulting. We identify like focus groups or interviews, um, social um, questionnaires and so on. For involve and collaborate, we have advisory boards, Delphi methods, workshops, and for empower the chariot and the advisory boards. Uh, within the Prep for Blue, we also develop a glossary. So if you are not familiar with this kind of um, terms, you can find a, def a definition in, in the glossary as well. Um, I didn't mention the interest of getting involved. 
um, for well, with, in the informed level, you just want to be informed. If you want to give your opinion, you would like to be consulted. Uh, and this is an, an increased level of participation. So the mission initiative, when involved and collaborate with partners, is in order to achieve the challenge goals defined by 2030. And the empower is, is a more uh, difficult to implement uh, where the mission initiative we implement the stakeholder decision. Uh, sorry, um, I just wanted to finish my introduction letting you know that um, there are another webinars in October. Uh, those are the identified here on the 16th and on the 30th. And again, if you go through the Prep for Blue website, you can register for them as well. So my colleague, Marta, now is going to uh, share some questions in order to engage with the audience today. Marta, the floor Thank is yours. you, Susana. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share uh, a presentation where you can write your the the first question is which country are you joining from today so i don't know if you can write your answers and yeah. we can see yeah uh there's people from spain from ireland oh, more people from spain it, it's getting bigger we have also people from germany we see that we have five responses i don't know if someone else is or we leave it at that. Okay, we are going to leave it at that and we're going to go to the next question. So what sector do you represent? Here you have several options and you can choose the one that uh, applies to you. We have people from university and or research and technology organizations. We have three people. <laughs> the, the column of other is getting smaller. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> now it's it's more equal. I'm gonna leave it there because we only have five people answer. So here we have the five people, and I don't know if someone else wants to comment. No. Okay. <laughs> then the last one is: In which sea basin are you developing your activity? So people from Mediterranean and people from the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I think we're missing a few people from the Baltic Sea. Okay. And um, from the Danube. Okay, and the Atlantic <laughs> here wins. Okay, thank you so much for answering. This was just to, to have an idea of the people that we have here in the webinar. So I give the floor back to Susana and to our speaker. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Marta. So the speaker today, as I said at the beginning, is uh, Dionisio Perez Blanco. He leads the economic uh, management of sustainable department at the University of Salamanca. And he is a consolidated researcher leading three Horizon Europe projects and some others funded by the Spanish government. And he also coordinates an uh, international network of 25 owner researchers uh, working in the co-creation initiative for global water um, assessment. Is that right, Dionisio? The floor is yours. Exactly. Thank you, Susana. Thank you so much for the introduction and for all the detail. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, so let me know if it's working. Um, so be here. Is it okay? Can, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so, well, uh, thank you so much, first of all, to Susana, uh, Marta, Lucia for the invitation. Um, I was very much looking forward to this presentation. Uh, my name is Dionisio Pérez and I work uh, in, well, I'm a researcher at the Universidad de Salamanca, conducting research on managing water scarcity, water quality in uh, river basins. Um, today I'm going to show a particular part of our research which focuses on co-creation, so essentially engaging stakeholders in order to achieve 
policies that are transformational, meaning that they are brand new to the area or they are implemented in a significantly uh, larger scale than they used to be. Um, so without further ado, uh, we will start to dig deeper into, into why we should care about co-creation, because this is relevant not only for inland water management, but also for the management of oceans. Actually, we have been working with some other colleagues managing uh, projects in the Mission Ocean, trying to collaborate on the development of serious games and other co-creation formula. Um, so as I was mentioning, the co-creation, the use of co-creation is not uh, implemented only by ourselves. Obviously, it's a tool that has been around for a long time. Um, the use of co-creation in policy design is growing. And here I'm showing just a few examples from the projects that uh, Susana was mentioning before in which we are involved as Universidad de Salamanca. I am the PI of these projects and we have uh, case studies all over the world. We have case studies in uh, Middle East. Uh, we are lacking here a couple of them in Africa. We have, we have case studies also in Egypt and, and Tunisia. We have case studies in Europe, obviously, given that they are mostly funded by uh, Horizon Europe, in Asia, South America, also in North America. We have a couple of them in California and, and, and Arizona. So the use of co-creation is growing and is becoming more and more important. Um, in order to start my presentation and provide some background, I would like to start by um, assessing what is driving this, this growth in co-creation. Why is it becoming more and more relevant? Because there are explanations for that. I mean, it's nothing that happens overnight. Uh, it's something that has involved a significant amount of work from scientists and policymakers, especially from policymakers. Um, so today I'm going to share with you uh, the view of, uh, well, my view, uh, my journey uh, from starting working on research as a modeler to integrate these models that I did with the work, daily work on st of stakeholders, especially policymakers, and uh, trying to mainstream these models into day-to-day -day policymaking by uh, decision makers. So it's not easy as you can imagine because policymakers have their biases and they are used to adopt uh, some tools. So it's not easy to change that overnight, especially when there are not clear incentives, but there are clear incentives. There are drivers that explain why co-creation is becoming more relevant. So um, in terms of water resource management uh, in inland waters, the, 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 the history has been um, driven by supply. So essentially, since uh, well, Chinese civilization, also here in Europe, the Romans, the Mayans in Central America, all of them already were working on supply infrastructures, meaning that whenever they needed some water, they built a new infrastructure to increase the supply. That means that, for example, here in Spain, we have a, a very, I mean, a very clear record of uh, working with the supply infrastructures. Uh, if you go around the country, you will see that we have several dams, canals. So essentially, what we were doing whenever we miss water in a place that we wanted to develop, for example, for irrigation, we built a reservoir, a canal. We put, the, we made the water available for irrigators, and we harness the potential of water for economic growth in this way. This worked reasonably well historically and still works in several regions and has led river basin authorities to develop tools that are de that are specially designed to deal with uh, the, the construction of supply infrastructure, basically with managing the supply of water. We have here some examples of the decision, decision support systems that are employed by decision makers all around the world. Here in Spain, for example, if you are used to river basin management planning, you will, you, you will know that uh, decision makers typically use aqua tool, but in other places around the world, we have other systems. We have SWAT, we have we have WIP, we have RIVASIM, we have TOPCAPI, we have different models that are being used uh, all around the world and basically are dominated by engineering because if you want to increase supply, your main concern is how to do that using engineering. So basically how to build new infrastructures that make the water available in a timely and reliable way. This approach is coming to an end. This is, and this is especially visible in Mediterranean areas. This is why when Marta made the question, I think that I'm working in the Mediterranean, in the Mediterranean basin. Um, so this model is coming to an end for a very single, for a very simple reason. Uh, we are uh, exhausting supply. I mean, water supply, as you know, is limited by the amount of water that uh, circulates into the atmosphere in a year. It's renewable, right? But when you use it or evaporates, then it takes some time to come back and you cannot make it immediately available. Um, so this is the water supply curve in a region in southeastern Spain, which is the Segura River Basin. It roughly uh, matches the region of Murcia. And what you can see here is the how the water supply has been historically satisfied. 
So initially you have with, with the Arabs, they relied mostly on the so-called acequia, which were small canals, and they were using surface water for irrigation. So this is the first amount, this is the first resource that was made available, and it was made available the first one because it was the cheapest one. Um, they started to use surface water, but at some point this was not sufficient. And they started to rely on groundwater, which you will see is slightly to the to the right of the of the presentation, not in the central part. Uh, and this is because as we started to uh, use groundwater and overexploit it, the piezometric levels, that is the level of the aquifer, the depth of the aquifer, um, became uh, higher, and therefore we had to dig deeper in order to uh, obtain the water. And that's obviously more expensive because of mainly the energy cost that it has. So um, after groundwater was overextracted, once groundwater was overextracted because it's overextracted it's still today, uh, and the prices of groundwater were increasing, the uh, decision makers or the users had to rely on different sources. And this is where we built a water transfer, a large water transfer, the larger water infrastructure in Spain that supplies water from central Spain, from the Tagus to the Segura River Basin and has created non-trivial complexities and uh, conflicts between the two regions, Murcia and Castilla-La Mancha. And finally, once we started to realize that this water transfer was not enough because agricultural uh, demand was still growing, we started to rely on alternative water resources, namely wastewater and desalinated water. As you can see, there is a problem here. There is a trend that the cost of supplying water, which is in the vertical hack in the vertical axis in euro cents per cubic meter, is increasing with its new source. So as you make more water available, you, are, you end up with a higher cost for that water. And eventually we are hitting uh, an asymptote. That basically the, what we this is what we when you hear an economy saying that the supply is inelastic or the demand is inelastic, in this case the supply, is because it becomes vertical, nearly vertical, with a very high slope. And this is what you can see here. The slope become, uh, becomes very steep, and that means that increasing a little bit the water supply becomes very expensive. This is driving the need for co-creation. Why? Well, essentially, because as we are realizing that we cannot increase supply anymore, we are realizing that therefore we have to act on the second component of water use. Water use is made of supply, the amount of water that is available, for use, and then the demand, the amount of water that is effectively used. You can have a lot of water supply, but just a little bit of, the, of demand, in which case everything is fine. Or you can have a small water supply and a very large amount of water demand that is larger than the supply, which is happening in all these Mediterranean basins. And that's a problem. That's a problem because, uh, well, you don't have enough to satisfy all the necessities from the users. And when you don't have enough, you have to start managing demand. You have to come to terms to the fact that instead of increasing supply, we need to reallocate the little amount of water that we have available. And that's problematic. That's problematic because of one key reason. When you're when you're increasing supply, everyone is happy because you're just making the an, an increasing amount of water available for the users. So the users are happy. They are, okay, we, we need this water. The government comes, builds a canal, and then makes uh, some sort of uh, cost recovery, which sometimes is not even close to 100%, but everyone is happy because the government makes people happy, the, 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 the people, well, you know, they, they vote, the users vote with their feet, so yeah, that has an implication, also a policy implication, and they get the water they need. When you have to reallocate a limited amount of water across users, you are creating winners and losers. Some people will receive the water, some others will not. And it's important to decide based on what criteria you are reallocating this water. Is it based on equity? So we give, we reduce the water allocation to each user by 10%, or is it based on efficiency? We give the water to those users that are producing uh, highest, the highest value added and therefore creating more employment, etc. It's a tough decision to make that policymakers are facing today. The problem is that they don't have the right tools to manage this because all the tools I showed you before, WIP, Aquatool, etc., are designed to increase supply. They are not designed to manage demand. Managing demand is complex, and in not, not a single one of these tools is going to tell you what the implications of reallocation for the socioeconomy, for the people, in the end, is going to be. So we need to adapt the tools. And we also need to adapt decision making, because decision makers are highly, um, they are highly trained people. I mean, they have an excellent training, but this training has been done based on a premise, which is that the water management is based on supply. And this is why you get that most of them are, for example, engineers hydrologists mainly. This is good, but now at this point, we have to also teach them or train them because they already know, but we have to make sure that they are aware of the implications of the reallocation and what are the socioeconomic implications that this may have. And this is 
complex, complex training, because it requires knowledge on sociology, uh, law, economics that an ecologist doesn't have. So we need to address all these, and obviously this is not simple. So here I'm going to represent to, to uh, show you uh, what's the well, what I understand is the key driver of this co-creation. It essentially is uh, inequality that you can you can generate when you reallocate the water. So a graphical representation of what I said before. This is the region Emilia Romagna in Italy, northeast Italy, and you can see here what the impacts of different irrigation restrictions are. And in this case, we are just reducing the allocation. So we don't have winners and losers, all people lose. But as you can see, the loss can be very asymmetric, depending essentially on what they are planting. It is a agricultural area, and we are assessing how much the farmers are losing. And the losses can be from small to very large, depending on the irrigation restriction that is implemented. So this tells us that uh, the way we allocate, we reallocate the water, the way we manage demand is important for the people and therefore is important for the decision maker and the policy maker. And here you have, for example, this is a very uh, simplistic uh, simulation that I did the other day for the purpose of this presentation. Essentially, uh, I am assuming that you have a drought that only impacts the Emilia Romagna region. And we we'll see what happens in the rest of Italy. And what we see is that the larger the uh, drought in the Emilia Romagna, the larger the benefits in the other regions. Why? Because since the drought is magically, because it's not going to happen, obviously, this is an assumption, concentrated in an area, which is Emilia Romagna, the other regions which do not have a drought can step in and provide the agricultural products that the Emilia Romagna cannot provide. And therefore, they benefit from a larger market share, larger income, larger uh, creation of jobs, etc. An assumption, but well, in reality, a drought that affects northern Italy may have benefits in southern Italy. So, there are winners and there are losers in the, with the drought, and therefore we have to manage them. So the question is, how do we manage it? So, um, and one may say, well, policymakers are there to find a solution. So, I mean, um, we pay them to do that, and it's their problem. But the problem that we are facing is that sometimes they don't know what to do. Because some of the reasons I mentioned before, but also others, sometimes they just not train to do this because it's not their area of knowledge. Uh, but also there are other explanations that I'm going to show you now that, so, that, that showcase why policymakers sometimes cannot find the solution. Even if they try, even if they want to uh, fight for the common good, sometimes they don't know how. And this is where co-creation is relevant. So first of all, one, uh, one explanation that um, so why policymakers may have trouble in uh, identifying what the best reallocation or demand management policy is in combination with supply policies, because I'm saying that they have to manage demand, but they still have to manage supply. They have to combine both policies, obviously. I mean, no one is going to tell to say here that you have to destroy dams or neglect the, uh, the conservation and the management of the dams. I'm not saying that, but you need something more. Uh, and the problem is that when you are integrating socioeconomic aspects with ideological aspects, you are considering two systems instead of one. And the uncertainties that you have in the modeling of the system, in the understanding of the system, they are, they are escalating, they are bigger. Here I'm providing an example. For example, here I'm showing what are the uh, costs, the impact of relinquishing an amount of water. You have in the, in the horizontal axis, you have the amount of water in million cubic meters. In the vertical axis, you have the cost of uh, reducing the, the amount of water that is being used for for irrigation in this case, and uh, in the in the graph inside the graph, I have essentially different models that are using different data inputs from different hydrological models. So essentially, what I'm, we are doing here is coupling economic models with hydrological models, and depending on the hydrological input that you use, the cost of this uh, water conservation policy can be two, three, four times larger. So, as you can see, this is an example of how uncertainty escalates. For example, you take uh, this value in, mid in between 200, 300, 250. The cost of uh, a water conservation policy can range from 250 to 750. So it's three times larger. And we don't know which one is correct. I mean, each model is telling us a different story. Which, what is showing is that when you increase uh, the complexity of water resource management by incorporating the demand, which is something that you have to do because you are constrained by the by that because the situation is changing, you are going to face higher uncertainty. And managing uncertainty is something for which stakeholders are often non-prepared. 
because they are uh, used to work in many cases with optimization. And when you tell them that you, they have to do robust decision making, meaning that they have to consider multiple plausible futures and identify those that uh, those futures in which the outcomes are reasonably satisfactory, they have difficulties in doing that. Luckily, there are tools to do it. There are tools that automate robust decision making, but it's also important that the stakeholder knows how decision making, robust decision making works in order to make sure that the heuristics that they implement are well informed. Because in the end, the decision is always made by the decision maker. A model is never going to replace a decision maker because of this mainly, because the models are uncertain. So someone has to take the decision in the end. And when there's uncertainty, well, this decision is more difficult. This calls for co-creation, obviously, because it calls for collaboration between science and decision makers and to make the decision makers more aware of this problem and understand how to manage it. Then there are also beliefs and cognitive biases. This is important. I was mentioning it before. Water resource management typically has been in the hand of engineers, including, for example, hydrologists, but also agricultural engineers. And if you think in terms, for example, of uh, what policy can work in a context of scarcity, historically, we have tend to think that irrigation modernization is a, a good idea because it saves water. And the truth is that while irrigation modernization is very good at increasing the income of farmers, in terms of water saving, it can backfire. It can backfire because of socioeconomic aspects. Essentially, water becomes more valuable because you modernize the irrigation and therefore you can produce more with a smaller amount of water. And that, may, that means that the farmer can irrigate more and therefore make more money. This is something that is difficult to understand unless you have concepts of uh, integrated concepts of marginal utility, uh, decision making by uh, agents that are dealt with in economics and in particularly microeconomics. The other way around is also, it also works. I mean, an economist is, I mean, cannot understand many of the complexities that water resource management has because he's not a hydrologist. So we need this collaboration, interdisciplinary collaboration between the two areas. Uh, this is here a world map in which I'm showing what's the impact of irrigation modernization uh, around the world uh, and in terms of what happens uh, with the water consumption. And as you can see, in most of the cases, you have a red triangle pointing up, which means that water consumption is increasing. Only in a few cases, including some in Spain, is decreasing. And in these cases, this decrease is typically driven by demand policies, for example, caps. Another example in which we saw what happens with the income, and in most of the cases, the income grows. And that makes sense because a farmer is not going to accept a policy that decreases the income. It's very difficult. In those cases where the arrow is pointing down, it is typically the case of large investment projects that are funded by external, for example, the World Bank in the case of Africa or uh, China or uh, uh, Central America. Uh, in which basically they give the money for a big irrigation modernization project and then it falls into disrepair because it's not working without any subsidy from the, from the institution. And finally, we have another one. For, you can forget about this graph, it's too complex, but I think with words it's easier to understand. Um, institutions have their own dynamic. This is something that those of you working uh, for, I mean, as decision makers or in uh, institutions that are working with the, that are involved in, involved in policy design, are facing situations in which they try to push forward a policy, say, okay, this policy thing is going to work, we should adopt it. But then the people or the institution says, no, I mean, this is not going to work. Uh, we are used to do this and we are not going to implement this uh, transformational change or this new policy. This happens everywhere. Institutions have their own dynamics and these dynamics are very difficult to change. And this is what we call path dependence or lock-in. So once basin authorities are used to build uh, dams and canals to address water scarcity problems, it's very difficult to make them change their mind and start building other, uh, I mean, start developing other alternative policies such as uh, water demand management. It's very complicated and that's making difficult um, the development of solutions such as this one. Here I'm showing the amount of, of, of resources that had to be invested in Australia, in this case in the Murray Darling Basin to develop a new uh, water allocation process, in this case, the buyback program, which is a program to reacquire water from uh, irrigators. So essentially in the water, the Murray Darling Basin, which is twice the size of Spain, um, had a problem with over allocation and they knew that um, they had to recover some of the rights. The water rights there are private, so they belong to the, to the, to the individual, in the case, mostly irrigators. So the uh, public sector came and said, okay, we are going to buy back these rights 
so that we have enough water at the outlet of the river and the river doesn't run dry. But it wasn't easy. I mean, it's, it was a long process that took uh, three decades that still is, go is ongoing, uh, in which institution invested a lot of money in reports, uh, in basically administration work and support, monitoring and evaluation. They needed to know where the water was missing, lacking, etc. So all this, it was a large investment. And that means that, well, essentially, lobbies and more institutional costs can lead to inaction. Okay, so now to the core of my presentation, what can we do now if we know that this is needed, if we need that we need a change in the way we do policy, and uh, we need that we, we know that the way we have been doing policy in the past is already not valid anymore. So what can we do? Well, the answer, the logical answer is to co-create, because we have seen that there are many problems that decision makers alone cannot address, and scientists alone cannot address, obviously, because those are not the people making the decisions. The problem is how? How can we co-create? How can we create these partnerships between scientists and decision makers so that we can actually uh, modify the way that water policy is developed? And this is applicable to water policy, to fund to fork strategies, biodiversity strategies, marine missions, etc. So it's the same everywhere. I mean, this process, this methodology has been applied in many different disciplines. So I really hope it's useful. So I will show you now my learning process, which is one, there are many others, but across along this learning process, there are many different tools that hopefully you can find uh, useful for your future work and uh, stakeholder engagement strategies. So first of all, uh, when, we, when we started to think of how we could match or change the way policy is being made in this case is in Spain, but we, I mean, also in other, in other, in other basins, we started with models. We started saying, OK, uh, probably the problem is that they have this WIP, this aqua tool, and these models are not ready to incorporate aspects related to uh, socioeconomy and also the complexity of climate change. So what we can do is maybe uh, combine the model that they are using with other models that can give them the information that they need in order to know how water allocations are impacting, for example, their local income, the employment, etc. The problem that we found is that when we developed this model that you see to the left hand side, the complexity was enormous, it was enormous. Even for me, it was, I mean, it was leading this project. It was difficult to understand how the model works. I mean, it was, we had so many models to account for uncertainty. So at each system level, we had multiple models. We had different scenarios because we wanted to reflect how climate change scenarios, how different climate change scenarios could impact water availability, how they could impact income, how they could impact employment. We also wanted to see how different models will impact the concept, will, will uh, affect the impact of different scenarios. So all these uncertainties have to be incorporated, but these uncertainties cascade over multiple systems. You have the climate system, you have the biological system, you have the water management system, and you have the socioeconomic system. And the more systems you add, this uncertainty, when they cascade, it tend to amplify and become really, 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 really wide and large. And it's difficult to manage and it's difficult to understand. So what we started to do in terms of co-creation, because the model itself is not co-creation, what we started to do is to adapt the model into a platform that the stakeholders could easily understand, easily follow, and mainly, because obviously we are not using a game for decision making, but the, the, the main objective here was to increase understanding so that they could see that the information that the model was providing was relevant for decision making. So essentially, we did that in, 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 a, in the context of a serious game. We have been doing multiple serious games over the past few years in the five continents, actually. Um, this is one version of the game that we applied two years ago in the Dover River Basin. We adapt the game to different um, platforms, so you can have the board card game, as you can have, as you have here with the cards. But you can also have a game in which uh, you, you, you show everything in, in a screen, so you get a computer video game. We also did that. So the game can adopt different forms. And the idea is to adapt the form that is more useful for the decision making problem at hand. In this case, we had different uh, users. We were thinking, we were dealing with the analysis. It's an area in which it was thought that there was a bit of illegal water use. And we wanted to uh, assess different management strategies for this illegal water use and how to make uh, ensure compliance. And this is why you have these cards in which we are showing uh, aspects such as use the water police, use remote sensing to identify illegal users, conduct an inspection with the satellite or increase the, char the, the water chargers, 
obviously you are selling water licenses and therefore that's uh, something that you have to keep into control in this game we have different players we have the river the river basin authority was one player the, then we have also farmers obviously we have the ministry as well and we have the society and scientists so we were playing with different um with different roles and uh, also one thing that we did was uh using what they call a role play approach in which we change the role of the users. So if you are working for the Basin Authority, you can play as the Basin Authority in the first game, but then you have to play as a, um, a for example, as a farmer in order to increase empathy. That, that's important as well, because this also, I mean, is part of learning to see how the other may feel when you make these sort of decisions. And this game has been quite successful. Uh, actually, we have used it in the context of other decision making exercises, not for, uh, I mean, this was in the context of a project, so it was not an actual decision making exercise, but we have used different approaches in order to inform dam construction in the Dover Basin, also with games. And it was also useful because the modeling approach, as you can see, is complex, but with the game, things are more easily to understand. And then we can uh, give some technical insights to those that are going to use the model because obviously the model is fully available and decision makers uh, know at least what to expect from the model. And yeah, I mean, we obviously this is not something that you can do overnight, but if you accompany decision making for a long period, it can work. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is obviously underpinned by co-creation. Uh, so these games are not just one game. So we play a number of games uh, in a row uh, in which we try to agree on the adaptation strategies and the scenarios. We also try to agree on the model so the model that you see that you saw before wasn't designed by ourselves just because uh, we wanted the first time it was designed by ourselves because we wanted to inform decision making but the truth is that in the end the final version was informed by stakeholders because some stakeholders said look this is not necessary or you are missing this or maybe this is not correct please change it so we were adapting it and finally what we create is a mechanistic model that is combined with the knowledge of the stakeholders. So by building this process of co-design, co-development, especially co-development, uh, we build ownership of the model and decision makers understand what the model is for and can use it, which is also very useful to co-identify and co-implement the policy, which is the last stage, which we have managed, uh, for example, we did in the case of the, of the dams that I told you before. We reached to the phase of co-implementation. In other cases, we are still in co-evaluation and it's a recursive approach and we are still trying to make a model that is comfortable for, for the policymakers. It's a long process, but still it, uh, it pays and it's much more effective than just producing a model and just uh, uploading it and, you know, and publishing in a paper and making it available when no one uses it in many cases. Um, this is an example of the, how the serious games have been implemented in the, this was a project that already finished uh, in Paranoa. What is about to finish and, and well uh, these are examples of uh, tunisia egypt lebanon italy so different cases in which we implemented this first round of serious game one thing that we started to realize is that this approach works really well when you have a consolidated network i mean if you know the people in the area if you know how they think you know how they are you know uh, you have a personal relationship with them because you have been working together for many years developing the model for example um, well, uh, in, if, if this happens, it's good because you can start with the co-creation straight, straight away and, and with the serious games, etc. But in reality, if you're starting from scratch, you need to build a community and that's not a straightforward because you need to build trust. You need to make people uh, aware of what you are doing and then you need to bring them together to a room and make them discuss a topic that can be controversial. And this is not straightforward. I mean, what I saw you before, um, I mean, occur because I mean, all the PIs in that project had very good contact with the Basin Authority, stakeholders, etc. But if you don't have and you have to start from scratch, well, you need to build the community. And this is something we are doing in the context of the Transcend project, where we have started to work in several basins in which we didn't know uh, who the key stakeholders We had an idea, but we didn't know the key stakeholders uh, personally, and we had to contact them. And we started by focusing on this initiation phase in which we basically identify the key stakeholders in the first step. So what were the key stakeholders for the policy that we wanted to assess or the context in which we were going to work? Then we started to build awareness with them. That was painful, it took a lot of time, but in the end it was rewarding. Finally, we managed to reach a critical mass of stakeholders that were relevant for the decision-making process that we wanted to, to, to explore. And then, only then, we started with the knowledge sharing, which would be the serious game. This knowledge sharing was further underpinned by the construction of governance bodies and rules of engagement. And it was necessary here because this knowledge network of stakeholders was new. 
they didn't know each other. So you have to make clear that there were specific rules. Maybe the other case was not necessary because they had been together for some time uh, working together. But in this case where they didn't know each other in order to build trust, we built these governance bodies and rules of engagement. And obviously we had to put a lot of effort and we are putting a lot of effort because this project is ongoing is in the, in the second year into reorganization and adding efficiency because some cases you cannot avoid that people are fed up or they don't like what you are doing or they don't like the outcome of a given meeting because they feel attacked and they leave the consortium and they leave the knowledge network and you have to find some other stakeholders that can complement uh, what they are taking, that can substitute their expertise. Sometimes this is not feasible, but uh, thus far we started with seven knowledge networks in the context of Transcend and we have only, uh, we only had to drop one, which we are trying to recover. Um, but I mean, there were different factors because the one we have to drop was Lebanon. And as you know, the situation there is quite complex. So there were many factors leading to that. Not only um, the stakeholders were not satisfied. Um, here you have different examples of how knowledge networks have been built. This is the first stage in which we were trying to consolidate the network and where we were building awareness. And this was the first meeting in the, of the knowledge network in different places, in the Hookah, in Castilla and Leon, in Lebanon. Uh, you have the case in the middle and well, we don't have it here, but there were also uh, others in South America, India, etc. And finally, uh, I wanted to show that, that uh, a, good a good experience we have been having over the past years is on the uh, stimulating international exchanges. So essentially when you have these knowledge networks, these knowledge networks sometimes are this is the knowledge networks are the networks of the stakeholders. This is what we call how we call them, but you can call them whatever you want. Uh, these stakeholder platforms or knowledge networks uh, are local. They are local and they are sometimes uh, very endogamic in the sense that all the solutions they reproduce are influenced only by the own dynamics of the base, which can be good. But sometimes we think it's good to uh, provide best case examples and just put the stakeholders together and uh, make them learn about something, about something that probably they don't know, or maybe they know a lot, but they can explain it to others. And this is how we, how we came with the idea of the International Knowledge Network in the context of two projects in which I'm involved, Natalanoa and Naturans. And in the context of these projects, what we are doing is basically developing an international knowledge network. This is no easy fit uh, because Typically, people uh, are less, are, are more reluctant to leave their base in. I mean, if you ask for a base for a meeting in their base close to their houses, that's fine. But if you ask them to close from Lebanon to Lisbon, as it was the case here, well, the situation is not that easy. So what we did is we looked for an umbrella. We looked for an institution, big institution in the area that could support this knowledge network, and that was the Union for the Mediterranean, which is the union of all the Mediterranean countries, including also 27 EU states member states and they were going to have a, a meeting in which they wanted to open a regional consultation process with the stakeholders and we offered them to use our knowledge networks and our co-creation approach in order to feed that consultation process they were only happy with the idea uh, also we had resources to set up the first meeting of this knowledge network international knowledge network so they basically gave us the uh, support institutional support and the stakeholders were much more eager to participate into this meeting when you can come across some ministers of your country or high level policy uh, policies so and discuss issues that for them are relevant um you can see me in one of these pictures this is where we were reporting the outcomes to uh, the union for the mediterranean and in the left hand side you can see the director of the water um, unit in the union for the mediterranean this took by the place uh, this took by the way place two months ago so uh, it's something relatively new three months ago and finally what i'm going to show here is uh, what i will think of as an idealized uh, ecosystem of innovation in which you uh, incorporate not only co-creation, which has been the main topic of my presentation, uh, which is here in the knowledge network, but also science production and piloting in living labs. So here uh, is what I think, in my opinion, based on my experience and also that of other colleagues, and this is how uh, an ecosystem of innovation where you can, which is a space in which you can really transform the society and policy. Uh, should look like and you also you obviously need the knowledge network and the co-creation but this has to be supported by some science including monitoring modeling and also piloting in in living labs and this is something we are doing in the context of my claim project and trust them so to conclude um i will i would like to provide uh based on the recommendation from from susanna which i think is a very good recommendation uh some steps some steps on how this co-creation process a knowledge network building process can be guided. 
Uh, in my, my opinion, I mean, this is obviously extremely simplificated, but there are lots of, uh, if you go to the website of the different projects, you can have, you can find there lots of information on how, take, how to take these different steps. Obviously, the first step is to define the, the labs and you have to define labs with transformational potential. So it's not useful if you define a lab and it's, uh, I don't know, Finland uh, to deal with water scarcity because probably it's not uh, relevant and there are, the, the origin is not there. Then you have to attract the stakeholders build the knowledge networks, that's also critical. You have to develop actionable science. So the science you develop has to be useful and readily, uh, and, and, and has to be in a position where it can be readily used by stakeholders. You have obviously to develop co-creation. And for that, today, I saw you some of the tools. So uh, these series games are quite useful and they can be online, in person, many other ways. You have to build ownership, this is important, you have to make sure that uh, after the project is over, um all this creation effort goes on there are many ways to do that uh, for example um leveraging further funding or basically the most uh, obvious one but perhaps the complete the most complicated one to make the decision makers adopt these models in four years this can be challenging um also develop adaptability to make sure that this uh, when necessary these knowledge networks can be renovated and updated and obviously upscaling i mean you cannot stop at the leading lab level because then what you're going to have is very good examples of how things may work ideally, but we need a um, wider scale transformation and part of that is upscaling the solutions. And that's it from my side. So thank you so much. Here you have the email. In case you want to drop me an email, feel free to ask whatever questions. Maybe you're shy or you don't have time now or whatever. If you want to make any question, feel free to contact me and also the website of the projects are, in the, are available here that I will leave. I will send the presentation and you can take a look. Thank you, Dionisio. I think that was a very interesting one. Thank you. Any Sam. questions? Um, if we don't have uh, questions from, from the public, uh, I had a several um, questions uh, to pose to this uh, so interesting presentation. Um, one of them, I, I guess, that will be maybe the most useful for us. Um, you have been uh, presenting how the co-creation can be a, a tool to avoid uh, having decisions only with the uh, influence of lobbies or some uh, users. Um, how are you addressing the balance of the groups? Because at the end, lobbies can be part of the decision-making, they are part of the decision-making, but it's a very uh, critical aspect uh, for the co-creation uh, to, to work, to have a good balance. C could you give a few words on that? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Lucia. And it's a problem we have uh, in every knowledge network, especially when someone drops the network, which is not common, but sometimes happens. And you have been very careful in trying to build a balanced network. You had to find a partner and sometimes it's complicated. So essentially, uh, there are two aspects, two key aspects here. Obviously, when you are uh, understanding the contextual dependence and what are the relationships of power in the basin, how the different stakeholders are connected to each other, it's important that you understand this very well that you invite the key stakeholders, and that includes the lobbyists. I mean, the lobbyists should not be left outside because they are a key uh, asset in the, in the, in the decision-making process. Typically, what we do is, is to adopt, uh, in, I mean, the, 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 key of, the key role here is to make sure that at the beginning they don't feel threatened, they don't feel that this is something that is going to change the relationship of power in the basin. It's just a pilot, an experiment to see if we can improve the situation of everyone. So we have to be careful how you present the thing. So it's not, you cannot go there and say, hey, look, we are going to change the water policy and we are going to reduce the water location for farmers by 60% because then you lose farmers automatically. So what we go is, okay, we know that there is a problem because typically in these in this basins, farmers know that there are a problem, they have a problem, they know it. And you try to build tools to, to talk about tools that are also useful for them. So for example, is insurance sustainable under the current context? Um, can you develop uh, robust strategies that ensure that the key crops with, with which you are making most of the money are sustainable into the future? And then, obviously, this doesn't prevent that you're going to have like lots of angry debate. So in order to avoid that, because that's also the second point, the second critical point I wanted to talk about, is to make sure that the debate is constructive and devoid of blame. It's super important. I mean, you cannot go there and 
and have the first day uh, people throwing at themselves heads on, I don't know, whatever they find because they are angry at each other. So what we have been using is something that has been already implemented, at, uh, I mean, in the discussions of the um, for the reductions of carbon emissions, which is the Talanoa Dialogue. Uh, the Talanoa Dialogue is basically a formula that was developed in the Polynesian Islands uh, to engage stakeholders in which from the very beginning you say, look, uh, the only condition we have for this debate is that you listen to the others and you respect the others. And that includes you cannot blame anyone. So you cannot go and say, no, this is your fault. So the river basin authority or the environmentalists they cannot go there and say, no, this is the problem of the farmers over exploiting the aquifer. Or I mean, they, they cannot say that. I mean, it's not allowed. If you do that, you're out. So they understand it from the beginning. And people, when they go to these meetings, typically they surprise us. We tend to think that they go there to do lobbying. They go there very relaxed. They know that they are not in a real decision-making atmosphere, at least not in the beginning. So they go there to learn, to see what's happening. and. Sometimes they really become become good friends, which is something that we stimulate as well. And it's not the real decision making; it's a tool. And what we want to show them is that there is an alternative way of taking decisions. We are never telling them what decisions mm -hmm. should take. It's something I said in the beginning. Uh, they know that they have to change the way they make decisions, but we never tell them that they have to. Something that they already know. I was wondering if you have uh, like. Um check of the numbers of each uh, group that is coming uh, gender and so on uh, mm. on, on the on the first uh, moment I, I i suppose you have to invite more than those that you finally want to get <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean it really depends uh, and a strategy we have been following lately is to invite first the key stakeholder to approach the key stakeholder which in the case of Europe, for example will be the basin authority if the basin authority agrees the other follow suit because they know that the basin authority is there, so they can they don't want to lose track. So the key first key target is the the institution or agent with more power. In this case, for example, for our case, the basin authority. In in Africa, for example, countries doesn't need to be the basin authority. Sometimes it's the regional government because the basin authority doesn't, doesn't have any real power. Um, so it depends on the area. You have to invite first that, uh, and then you start to contact the others. Once you are you have already contact the Basin Authority and you know that they are interested, which is something that has to be done before launching the project even. You just contact the others and, and invite them. There is no magic number. It's important that this balance, uh, it's important that the key users are there. And you can have four people of environmentalists and then two farmers. It's fine because in the serious game, when they play, you're going to make them play in different roles. The important thing is that they understand. We try to make it balanced, it's important. But we are not going to close the door, for example, if five uh, different farming associations decide to come and then only one environmentalist comes. We're not going to say, OK, look, farmers, you cannot come uh, because we try to build and we try to make more comfortable the basin of the environmentalists, perhaps try to uh, take care of, of, of that person. Um, but I mean, it's something that you cannot do in the beginning. You don't have that luxury. <laughs> you have to bring up all as many as you can. And then obviously, as time goes, you have this adaptive efficiency. And obviously, you try to address the gap. So once the network is consolidated and the, you try to address the gap and say, OK, look, we are missing this. Uh, we are going to approach these guys. And if you think it's good, we are going to bring them. And typically, they are reasonable and they understand. They say, OK, yes. Sometimes there are some you know, personal issues that may come in between, but typically, you don't find that. And, and regarding gender balance, that's a big issue. But it's not something you can really uh, addressing countries like, I don't know, Middle East, because all the positions of power are, take, are taken by men, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some exceptions, uh, but usually you, when you go and call the Basin Authority, the, the president of the real Basin Authority is a man. And if you want to have that person, uh, the only thing you can do is bring him aboard. But we keep track of it, and we are very concerned of it. And in the, in the adaptation we do later on, we try to bring more women into intermediate positions. Like, okay, you broke the next time you come here to the meeting, try to bring, I don't know, someone who did technical expertise who's a woman. And yeah, they are they 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 tend to uh comply. So we are addressing the balance, but the balance, the gender balance is an issue. Yeah. Do you change gender in the in the roles you give in the serious playing? Yeah, of course, it's a very aspect of the. It can be a very aspect, a serious aspect of the serious game, especially in some cases where uh, women are uh, taking care of water supply. In many cases, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we had a game as well. Um, we keep track, and we 
also keep track of the knowledge network, how it develops and how many women we have. We have something that I didn't mention because it's like uh, too technical, but we have something we call the impact champion indicators, which, which are indicators that we keep track of and they include the gender. So, but one of them is the gender. Another one is, I don't know, number of, uh, and I don't know, uh, newsletters that we have sent or number of calls that we have had with this. So to keep balance, I mean, that to make sure that you are not talking all the time to the same one, to the same institution, but that includes gender. We have gender balance. And this is why we know that in some cases we have to improve and we keep trying to improve, but in some cases it's not happening. Um, we, we fund the, the traveling cost, and this is something that keeps under control to some extent who we can invite. So we tell them, okay, you bring a woman in the next, uh, to the next workshop, we can pay for the cost of both of you. And this is something that helps, but sometimes they don't bring it. So yeah, we push, but you can just push to a certain degree, but I, I, I understand. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big issue in, especially in some countries. In Spain, for example, we don't have gender issues. We address them, uh, even if the position of power are also taken by men in most of the cases, but still, uh, we managed to bring also women at intermediate positions and, and it's more balanced. Okay, we are over time now, so I think that we should go close in the meeting. Um, anyone else from the audience have any other question? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Dionisio and all the attendees for being here today. Um, yeah, uh, Marta just shared yes. at the chat <laughs> the, satis the satisfaction survey. Thank um, you, Susana. If you have a few minutes to, to fill out, please do it. Uh, because we would like always to to improve, um, even though I think that the level is quite high and I really <laughs> enjoyed the meeting today. So thank you very much all. Have a lovely day and see you in the next edition. Cheers. Bye-bye.